Hey guys, Woodruff here. So now we're going to get into thermal disorders. Um, this is another one of those like tiny topics that we had to squeeze in somewhere. And this is kind of where it fits if you think about it. You know, it's, if you really stretch it, it's kind of in the uh, uh, musculoskeletal because it does, it can affect the muscles. But um, yeah, it's kind of its own little thing here. Um, well, I guess, no, I, I would say actually it's more neuro than anything. But anyway, all right, I'm going to stop because it's all about like, because temperature is all about your brain regulating it so I'd say it, it maybe it fits in neuro more but it can some parts of it can affect your musculoskeletal so um this is gonna probably be a two or three part video where I first talk about heat related disorders and then there's two cold related disorders which is frostbite and hypothermia so um these are shorter topics so you may just want to skim over them or just ignore them but trust me you're gonna want to know them um it may be uh, blah, blah, I can talk it may not be something something that you see every single day, but um, knowing about temperature regulation is super important. So let's jump in and we're going to start with a question. Yay, your favorites. Don't you just love like when you go to class and your professor starts the class with like a quiz? So much fun. Anyway, um, so I'm calling this a drag and drop just to get you kind of in the next generation mind frame. Um, you can do it however you like. Ah, no. Um, just kidding. Sorry, there was a hair on my screen. Anyway, I, I love, and by the way, just real quick, I love how my PowerPoint will change slides when I'm not trying to, but when I'm actually trying to, it won't. Anyway, just saying, life hates me. So let's look at risk factors for heat disorders. So we're going to look at these and select the statements that put a client at greater risk for heat-related disorders. So for each of these, it's kind of like doing a true-false. Does this put a person at risk for heat-related disorders? So the first one is client is a 79 year old male. So it's really saying, does being a male or being an older male put you at risk for heat related disorders? And the answer is yes. And it's not because they're male, it's because of the age. Um, being very young or very old puts you at risk for any sort of um, thermal disorder. The next is client has a history of hypothyroidism. Um, this one is going to be no. So uh, maybe hyperthyroidism could um, make it more likely that you can get a fever and temperature, but hypothyroidism, they actually are more prone to cold um, intolerance and um, having trouble where they, they actually sometimes have trouble getting warm um, or they can have, um, they have issues uh, not necessarily with their like regulation of their temperature, but they have more of a cold intolerance or um, they can, if they get into a really bad crisis, things usually get low rather than high. Um, client has a history of heart attack. This is going to be a yes. Um, and um, any sort of cardiovascular disease history is going to increase their risk for heat related disorder. So that also means that client has a recent stroke Yes, um, it's partially because of the neurological stuff, but also anything that affects the vascular system can affect flow. Um, so people that have cardiovascular disease are going to be at risk. Ooh, this one's a little bit trickier. It says client has a hemoglobin A1C of 5.6. Now that if you know your hemoglobin A1C, which hopefully by now you do, um, 5.6 is a good hemoglobin A1C. So it's really saying, um, really the, what this is testing or asking you is if a client, because you might go like, ooh, diabetes, hemoglobin A1C. Yeah, that's it. Because diabetes is a risk factor for heat related disorders. But if I have a hemoglobin of five point, uh, hemoglobin A1C of 5.6, am I actually diabetic? At this point, there's nothing to show they're diabetic. So no, having good glucose control does not put you at risk for heat related disorder. The client is on birth control. Hmm, birth control does put you at risk for multiple things, but one of them is not heat related disorders, um, not directly. A uh, client enjoys running outdoors. So this is all now we have to think about like there's certain like history, medications, like non-modifiable factors. There's also environmental factors that can affect your risk for um, heat related disorders. Does like um, does enjoying running outdoors put you at risk? It can because um, not necessarily as much for heat stroke and stuff like that. But if you like running outdoors, you're going to be more likely to have heat cramps or possible heat exhaustion if you like to run very far. Now, I know what y'all are thinking. Well, we don't know where they live. We don't know because what if they're running in Alaska? Um, but just in general, if you're thinking in general, running outdoors, like pretty much be doing something strenuous outside um, can put you at risk. Ugh, now I'm going, my mind's wanting to go back. You know, that's the hard thing about being a professor is like, 
every time you write a question, you're like, this is a good question. Like, I think I've thought of everything a student could say. Like, then you start like, it's like the, your voice is like swarmy in my head. And I'm like, I can't, I can't breathe in my own head. Cause I'm just imagining you saying, but, but. So um, I will say that, I mean, yes, it usually has to be a hot place. So now I'm probably going to want to update this and enjoys running outdoors in Texas. Um, so um I what he caught him, but yes, generally exercise outdoors, especially in a hot climate, will put you at risk. So just imagine this says client enjoys running outdoors in Texas. So then last but not least, it says client lives in Seattle, Washington. So sometimes just living in a certain area. So you'd have to know some climates. I promise you, we're in, if you are not the geography um, king or queen um, or whatever you like to be, um, then you will still be okay in this exam. We're not going to give you anything crazy. We will give you something very, um, very well known. Uh, so um, just real quick side story, because I know you guys live for these. Is, is that um, I really am a very honest person, maybe too honest sometimes. Um, but when I was in like, hmm, probably like third, fourth, fifth grade, I wanted so badly to have a talent that I actually, um, uh, what do you call them? I uh, cheated off the person next to me uh, on a geography B because I wanted to be in the geography B and um so I got in the geography B but because I cheated I knew nothing so <laughs> it was like the shame of my life um I'm very bad at geography so if you're if you're keeping a list of things that I'm good and bad at geography like math which you guys know geography is another one the only way if you ever like read about me like oh yeah I heard she was in a geography B when she was a kid just know that I cheated so Seattle Washington is not a greater risk because it's a it's usually a cooler climate they don't have very big um you know like heat like they would in other areas it's more towards the north um and they tend to stay a little bit cooler so um, let's look at some of these risk factors um, other risk factors would be like i already talked about older age and younger because as you get older your temperature regulation gets off and when you're younger you don't yet have it especially like infants climate can make a difference, chronic disease, and think, you know, um, any sort of neurological chronic disease, cardiovascular, kidney, lung disease, all the chronic stuff um, or history of, you know, those kind of diseases can cause a problem. Diabetes um, also um, is a risk factor. There's a lot more too. There's a ton of medications and stuff like that. Um, but the other thing I'll say is also some drug use like amphetamines can do it. And when we talk about heat related emergencies, there's three type of there's three types of injuries or emergencies. There's heat cramps, heat exhaustion, and heat stroke. Um, and pretty much either you have prolonged exposure to heat or very short bursts of intense heat that leads your body to not be able to compensate anymore. Um, and really want to think if you're getting hot, you're getting dehydrated, things like that, it can lead to some issues. So let's differentiate these. Um, so the, like I said, the three types, cramps, exhaustion, and stroke. So heat cramps are usually um, from short-term exposure to heat. Um, so this is someone, like think of someone who's running outside in the Texas heat um, and um, is not well hydrated. So um, usually with these patients, uh, they've been outside for short periods of time and maybe had like really intense exposure to heat. Um, <clears throat> back when I was in nursing school, I, um, I was a pretty avid runner um, because I had to get my stress out. Like there was this one time I got a very bad grade, not a very bad grade, but I got a bad grade on a paper that I thought was really unfair. And so like, I'm not a runner and I ran like three miles, no joke. And so like, and like when I say I used, I used to run, like I used to run, but I didn't do it well. <laughs> so I tripped a lot, um, but I did like five Ks and stuff like that. And I very slow, but I did it. Um, so yeah, for me running three miles, like that was a big thing. Like, cause this was before maybe I started doing five Ks, but I was so angry. I remember just like running and just needing to get my steam out, but I live in Texas. So when I used to do these runs, I remember sometime I was like, okay, I'm going to go early. It won't be that bad. And I I'd start my run. Like I said, I'm slow. So I was like, you know, um, I was doing my, you know, gentle pace. Um, but by the time I would finish, you know, sometimes um, it was like, it was so hot. Um, and I also have asthma, which doesn't help. <laughs> so, but uh, yeah, needless to say, um, I remember those days, like where I was sitting there and I was like, it was so hot. Like I felt like I was going to burst. So that's more like heat cramps. Um, and so, and we'll talk about the cramps part here soon. We're going to talk about signs and symptoms, but um, this is more just kind of differentiating what they are. So heat cramps are like short-term exposure to heat. There's heat exhaustion. So think these are people that maybe work outside in a hot climate, 
um, you know, like construction workers um, and things like that, that have an outdoor job. It's usually, it's not even just about working outdoors. It's usually like a phys physically strenuous job too. Um, so I think people that are outdoors um, for long periods of time and exposed to the hot climate and also, um, uh, you know, doing some sort of, it doesn't necessarily have to be incredibly strenuous, but some sort of activity that's going to cause them to be um, working harder than just um, sunbathing. And then last but not least, um, a heat stroke, which is a medical emergency. And this is where you get to the point where you completely lost the ability to regulate your temperature. Like your brain is in charge of regulating your temperature. And if it gets to a certain point, it's like, okay, I'm going to turn off now because um, I can't, I can't work under these conditions. Um, so it, it tries to compensate and do so much for so long, but you get to a certain temperature and it's not working anymore. So to differentiate these by symptoms, when we look at heat cramps, like I said, they're those brief, intense uh, moments of exposure to heat, and they can end up with symptoms of dehydration, like your increased heart rate, sweating, nausea, weakness, um, but they also, um, they're called heat cramps because they usually have brief, intense muscle cramps. Um, so that's how those are different. They don't necessarily have to have an increase in temperature. Um, a lot of times it's just the cramps and then signs of dehydration. Heat exhaustion is going to be where you have a lot of the same symptoms, like symptoms of dehydration, you're tired, um, GI symptoms, really thirsty, maybe anxious. But now we're also adding in an increased temperature, and that temperature can be anywhere from 99.6 to 105.8. Um, and then they also um, can have like low blood pressure, like severe dehydration. Um, so you're starting to have like some instability here. And then when we get all the way to heat stroke, now our temperature is above 105.8. Um, and because of that, you know, we're getting to the point like literally feel like, like or like think of it this way is like your brain is getting fried. So your temperature is going to be above 105.8. Your mental status starts changing. Um, and don't mind the extra comma on the end. Um, and then you also tend to have, this is the only one that tends to have tachypnea or you're breathing really fast. Your body's trying to compensate. Um, and I don't, it's not that the tachypnea is going to change the temperature, but your body is reacting to um, all the changes. So my priority assessments, of course, are going to be to take a temperature, um, ask them about the symptoms they're experiencing, check their blood pressure, heart rate, um, respiratory rate. Um, that neurological uh, assessment is really key because it's going to help to differentiate when things are getting worse because um, you want to make sure that their um, their mental status should be stable or improving. If it's getting worse, they could be leaning towards heat stroke. Um, and then checking their urine output because everything, you know, with, um, you know, being too hot or um, having a heat injury or um, <clears throat> um, thermal, I was going to say, heat injury or heat, what's the other word I'm looking for? Heat, heat, heat emergency. There we go. I can talk. Um, heat emergency is that you can be very severely dehydrated. So we want to see are the, um, it's a good, the best measure of hydration usually is going to be urine output. So I don't know if they're getting better or worse. So they're getting better if their temperature gradually decreases. Um, they have adequate urine output showing signs of hydration. Their blood pressure, heart rate stabilizes. Mental status, level of consciousness is stable or improving. Um, things are getting worse if their temperature is getting worse. Um, their kidneys are starting to show signs of more dehydration, less urine output or no urine output. Um, vital signs becoming more unstable um, or if they're having a decrease or a worsening level of consciousness, mental status. So the treatment kind of varies because there's obviously different levels of severity for heat injury. So, um, you know, for heat cramps, what we're going to do, since it's just the muscle cramps and dehydration, um, for the cramps, we can elevate them, do gentle massage, pain management if needed. Um, mostly it's just giving them, and they usually are not going to have that bad of nausea. So usually they can take an oral. Um, we want not just water replacement, but sodium replacement too. And we usually want to teach these patients, hey, like if you're going to be running outside, you know, um, having that um, Gatorade or, um, you know, the other, I don't know what the cool ones are these days because I'm really not hip and with it. Um, but, um, and I know there's like better words now. It shows you just how like not hip I am. Um, but I'm not even like hip enough to I'm, like, I'm hip enough to know that that's not a cool word. Um, but I'm, I know that there's like a new word with the new generations, but I just don't know what it is. Um, so anyway, but, um, we're trying to 
so yeah okay I was just in there yeah I was just I was rereading my stuff I was like what um anyway um so they usually can take everything in orally and like I said we want to give them sodium and water and we want to tell them about um you know like electrolyte um not just to be drinking water when they're out and about but to also make sure they're getting that electrolyte replacement if they're going to be out like running and things like that outside um rest and then nothing strenuous for 12 hours um they can go home they can be managed they do not need to be uh, admitted to the hospital. Heat exhaustion can be managed outpatient, but sometimes they end up needing to get admitted. Um, we pretty much do cool environment. We remove any constrictive clothing, you know, um, cool things down. And students always ask this is like, am I allowed to change the room temperature? Absolutely. Um, you can change the room temperature and um, uh, help to um, decrease people's temperature, like take off extra blankets, stuff like that. Um, we are going to give them uh, oral fluid and electrolyte replacement, but if they're nauseated, they may need the IV fluid replacement and some nausea meds. And if they're not better in a few hours, we're usually going to admit them if they're um, not um, starting to show those signs of improvement we've talked about. Then last but not least, heat stroke, with is, which is an emergency. Um, we're going to be doing things like 100% oxygen. We're going to do continuous monitoring because they can't have electrolyte imbalances and dysrhythmias. I'm monitoring those electrolytes closely. And for heat injuries, when it's an emergency, like a heat stroke, we want to rapidly cool them. When I say internal and external, what I mean is external is more obvious. Like we're going to um, do things like ice packs, take off extra clothing, change the room temperature. But internal is going to be um, like there's, oh, and external could also be like there's cooling blankets that we can put underneath them. Um, internal is, is that there are, um, we could do cold IV fluid. Fluids. Um, we could also, there's a um, machine called an Alceus and um, it, it can be used to warm people up, but it can also be used to cool people down. And so um, we've used that sometimes in patients. It requires a special um, central line in their groin and we'd only use it in extreme cases, but it helps us to, you know, monitor and alter their temperature um, in a safe manner. Um, know that for heat stroke antipyretics, Tylenol, acetaminophen, you know, all of it, it's not going to work. So um, they're not effective because they only work if my brain has control or regulation. And remember when we've gotten to heat stroke, that does not, it's not in control. It is no longer functioning. Um, then IV fluids, like I said, they'll usually be cool IV fluids. Um, we're trying to hydrate, um, but we're also trying to cool. We want to prevent shivering because if they start shivering, then their body temperature is going to get warmer. Um, there's medications that can be used to prevent shivering if needed. Um, and then monitoring their kidney function, just making sure that they're staying stable and they have good urine output. And then um, sometimes with the shivering or with the uh, heat injuries and um, the, sometimes the way that they get them, they can have like muscle breakdown and stuff. So just watching it closely. Anyway, that is heat related disorders. I'll see you for the cold stuff.